Okay. Um, quickly here, just so I don't forget. Uh, let's go ahead and let's check, uh, commit our changes here and push the, uh, the update. That way you guys will have the latest, you know, kind of the final solution to this. And then let me just talk through what uh, it would do to, to extend it. That way we have time to do the intro for the thing for the homework assignment. So we got a little bit of a late start, uh, if that's cool. It's not a huge, won't be a huge deal. So I'll go up here. I'm going to say commit my changes. So this is all the stuff I've done today. And we'll say solution to huge integer assignment. And notice it sees that I have a new class called huge integer.java. It's going to commit. So I made changes to the link list. I made changes to the main activity. I made changes to my layout file. So it's detected all the stuff I've made changes to. It did all that for me. So I'll just do commit and push and does the whole code analysis stuff. There's warnings, blah, blah, blah. Just say commit and then push and it's up there. So you click on the GitHub link for your template for your homework assignment. This will have the, the latest thing. All right. Um, so what I was saying before is what I, so right now we kind of have a huge integer is implemented in terms of a link list. So um, the huge integer maintains a link list version of himself that he requires this link list class to, uh, to support. Now that might actually be the way you would implement it in real life if you uh, already had access to a link list otherwise. So like for instance, built into Java, even though we're not allowed to use it yet, there's already a link list class, okay? Um, so you probably wouldn't reinvent the wheel for that. Uh, instead, you would just use the link list class that's already there and you would do something very similar to what we did here where you implemented huge integer and huge integer just had a link list for storing its information. But if we were writing our own link list, one thing we could have done here is rather than having two separate classes, a huge integer and a link list, we could have written huge integer as a link list. So you could do this two different ways. On one hand, we can say this guy is going to extend link list. So by doing that, we would say a huge integer actually is a link list. So he gets all the link list features. And then we can add some stuff beyond that, like how he builds himself and stuff like that. Similarly, we could have also forgotten about our kind of, we have a kind of a generic implementation of a link list here. We could have had a link list like data structure that is less generic and really works in the exact ways that we need it to work for our, uh, um, huge integer. So for example, we always add it to the front, correct? So we don't need add end. We don't need a link list that ha knows how to add end. We didn't use it. So we really only need a link list that knows how to add front, which is actually the easiest, the easiest function, right? So really huge integer could have been implemented where he just had a node head and the equivalent of add front to keep track of the list. And then he didn't even need to be implemented in terms of a linked list because he was a linked list. Kind of makes sense. So it just would have kind of brought it into its own thing, but then it would have also been special purpose. You can only use that guy for huge integers at that point. Where in uh, um, our version here, we kind of have this tool, this kind of generic linked list that we can, that we've repurposed for supporting our huge integer. So this would be more of an example, the way we did it would be more of an example of kind of the, the use of data structures. We didn't reinvent the wheel. We said, look, I need to hold an arbitrary number of digits. I already got a dude that can do that. I have a linked list class that we wrote that can do that. So rather than reinvent the wheel, I'll have my huge integer do its thing in terms of that guy. Make sense? Okay, so let me go ahead and close this. This is homework two template, so we're going to do a homework three. Um, well, I'll say homework three template. Is that actually true? Because I'm going to write a different... Well, here, let me start off by showing you what we're going to do. So we talked about, uh, well, you wrote your paper on stacks, right? So what's a stack? Uh, 
Um, okay. So uh, the way recursion is implemented in uh, modern programming languages requires a stack data structure. Okay, but what is a stack data structure itself? What is it trying to emulate? Okay, so we so it's a it's a last in first out queue, right? LIFO, LIFO queue. Um, okay. Well, so let's let's think about it. So we kind of got to go need to go back and be less technical about this. So we think about what's a linked list. Let's go. Let's ask that question. Now we've practiced with a linked list a bunch. What would you say is the purpose of a linked list? Other than just torture. Like, why do they exist? What problem is linked list solving for us? Yeah, so one of my problems is, is that if I have to hold a whole bunch of data, I don't know how much data I need to hold, we need something that can stretch, right? That's flexible, that can hold a small amount of data or a large amount of data, and it can just roll with the punches. That's the problem linked list solves at the cost of, you know, um, speed, right? So what problem does stack solve for us? Again, trying to think non-technical. So uh, not that we really have these anymore, but I mean, but but you know, you can. Well, I guess they still, they still make magazines, right? Like Vanity Fair and stuff like that, whatever. Okay. So when you have uh, magazines at your uh, your house, how do you store them? Do you just throw them all, all around? Maybe you do. If you do, don't. <laughs> how do you store your? What's the efficient way we store magazines? Oh, a stack of them, right? Man, it's funny how those names sound so similar. <laughs> they sound similar, right? So what do we do? We put a magazine down. We put the next one on top of that. Next one on top of that. Next one on top of that. The last magazine we put on the stack is the first magazine we take off of the stack. And kind of re uh, removing something from the middle of the stack is uh, has danger associated with it, right? Stack might tip over. But we've decided this is something we use in real life for solving a problem, right? So. The strength of a stack of magazines is that uh, it's kind of convenient. You just keep piling them on top of each other and you, you've built your little tower, right? What's the weakness of that stack of magazines? Uh, well, potentially you get too, too, haul, too high, it falls over. Okay, but the one I'm looking for is the, the so. To, yeah, so once you get 30 magazines on there, and you're, you're like, oh, well, I, I want to read that article about, you know, X, Y, Z. I wonder which magazine that was in. Searching through that data becomes problematic, right? So stacks uh, are, are useful for certain cir cir circumstances. They're not so useful in other ones. But it's a data structure. It's a way of organizing our data. So when it makes sense, they're great. When it doesn't make sense, they're not that great. So it's not an upgrade to anything. It's just a thing. It's the way we organize things in real life. Why shouldn't we have a data structure that's, that does something similar? I've kind of said the same thing. Human beings solve problems the way we solve problems. We're great problem solvers, right? What's the job of a programming language? To allow us to solve problems the way we already kind of think through problems. So if we think through problems in real life using things like lists of things and, and stacks of things and some of that, it might make sense to bring some of those things into the programming world to solve similar type problems, right? Okay, well, what we're going to write today is an introduction for your homework assignment, um, which, uh, so I'll, I'll scare you first, all right? So your homework assignment, I'm going to have you read this, uh, it's going to be a Wikipedia page which explains the algorithm. The algorithm is called the shunting yard algorithm. It just sounds scary, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's actually... It's called shunting yard. It's for doing, um, remember back in 535, that process expression uh, thing where you had to take in a string that was like a math function and do, uh, but I said, oh, you can just do everything left to right. You know, you don't have to worry about orders of operation. 
Well, shunting yard is an algorithm for taking into consideration orders of operation. So you'll be able to, uh, well, assuming you get yours working, you'll be, <laughs> you'll be able to handle all the orders of operation for shunting yard. Um, it's actually not bad, it just sounds scary. Um, but make sure you understand the problem you're solving first. So read through the Wikipedia and kind of walk through it by hand and understand it. It's actually not that difficult. All right, but we're going to talk about stacks today because you're going to need stacks for that dude. Okay. Yeah, push, pop, peek. Would be the, the three. So push is pushing something on top of the stack. Popping is taking off and removing the top of the stack. Peaking is just looking at the top of the stack. Uh, well, is empty checks to see whether a stack has nothing in it. But that wouldn't be one of the default functions. Yeah, push, pop, peak are the, 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 every stack has push and pop. Peak is, is I think, is a primitive. Yeah. 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 I mean, so if you, if, if you focus on push and pop, it's fine. You know, the peak is one of those things where um, it's definitely the, Third most popular. Um, I think it's every stack should have peak. Because peak lets you glance at what's at the top of the stack without moving things that are in the stack. All right, so what we're going to do to practice with stacks today um, is how many of you have heard of the game called Towers of Hanoi? Okay, in Towers of Hanoi, we have three, uh, three towers. Okay, each of these are a stack. All right. So, um, and notice we can kind of, you know, we can make our towers larger, but the, the default one starts with three, um, you have three elements, three disks on the far left stack. And your goal is to get everything over to the far right stack. Now, when you take an element off and you drop it onto another stack, the rule is you cannot put a larger disk on top of a smaller disk. That's an illegal move right there. Does that make sense? So if we're gonna just restart this guy. So we would go here then here, then here, then here, then here, then here, and there. So now you've completed Towers of Hanoi. Make sense? All right, so what we want to do is, first of all, we're going to start with just the ability to deal with a single tower. All right, so that is we need to have the ability to put elements onto a stack. Now, this guy is like a um, vertical linear layout, isn't it? When I put something on, the difference is, is that by default, when you add something to a vertical linear layout, it goes to the bottom. If I keep dropping, it goes to the bottom. Well, really, when we put, um, when I drop this guy into this vertical linear layout, he actually ended up on the top. Make sense? So we need to make sure we add it in the right order. So we're going to represent our towers as vertical linear layouts. And then maybe our disks are, um, uh, well, we can go a couple different directions. Let's just, to keep it simple, let's have our disks be maybe labels with this a number on it. Uh, that way we don't have to mess, too, because of time, we don't have to mess too much with like visual, how wide it is, that kind of stuff. So we can always come back and do that at a, at a later date. But so we're going to have things with text views in it, where a text view will either have a one, a two, or a three in it, okay? And um, where a three would be our biggest one, a two would be our second biggest one, and a one would be the tiniest uh, uh, disk. And they'll all be piled on top of each other in the first guy. And maybe we have buttons at the top that says, pop off of this guy, push on to this guy. Make sense? Something along those lines? So first, we need to get one working so we can kind of see how a how a, a stack should work. So I'm going to go in, and I'm actually not going to call this guy a homework template because it's really a different thing. It's related to the homework, but 
I would probably would not have you check this out to work on the homework. I would probably have you start a fresh project for your homework. Does that make sense? I'll still give this to you, but it's probably not your starting point for the homework assignment. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start a new Android Studio project. And we're going to call this dude um, CSC 537TOH. Um, and this is, uh, say, this is like fall 2017 underscore TOH. Uh, might as well just spell it out. Towers of Hanoi. All right, I'm putting this in my Dropbox for 537. Next, we'll do it for API 15. Always start with an empty activity. And we'll name our main activity and activity main. That's fine. Okay. So let's go into our activity main here and let's minimize this guy and zoom here a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dump that text view that's in there. Let's throw a vertical linear layout in here. All right. And then, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a couple of uh, areas. We're going to end up having three towers in here to put stuff and then have buttons on top of them. So we'll have three towers, we'll have three buttons across. So we're gonna need horizontal linear layouts for that, horizontal linear layouts for my towers, um, to hold my towers, and then three vertical linear layouts for representing my towers. And then I'm gonna have this placeholder thing up here. So uh, um, let's do, let's just start building this stuff in. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna give myself a horizontal linear layout. I'll put it right here. And then I'm going to throw some buttons in there. So there's one button. There's two buttons. There's three buttons. So we'll call this tower one. Tower two, tower three. All right. Um, and let's actually call this guy our um, actually, I don't think we need to call him anything. We're not going to use anything with him. So we're fine there. All right. So there's our three uh, three buttons. Now I'm going to create another horizontal linear layout. Under this guy. And I actually want him to be below the button ones. All right, so here's this horizontal linear layout. And inside of this guy, I want to put three vertical linear layouts. Vertical, vertical, vertical. All right, and this guy is going to be tower one layout. This is tower two layout. This is tower three layout. All right, so there's my three layouts. Now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna throw um, 
some text views into this guy to represent my initial tower. All right, so we're going to call this guy uh, disk one. We'll put text in there that just says one. We'll come back to that here in a second. I'm going to go ahead and copy that guy and put this to this three. So this is disk two. Actually, I'm going to call this disk one TV for text view. So this is going to be disk two TV. And this will be disk three TV. All right, so these guys are all living inside of um, this vertical linear layout. Now, the height of this vertical linear layout, so I need these guys to be bigger here for a second. All right, so here's my horizontal. All right, so this horizontal, I want to set its height to wrap the content. All right, so um, that way it's wrapped around the button instead of taking up the entire screen. It was matching the parent before. That's why we couldn't see the other guys. And here's our um, three disks. So this is disk two. We'll put a two on there. This is disk three, we'll put a three on there. And we wanna go ahead and we're gonna say that this tower, we don't want it to match the parent. Instead, we want the width to, let's say, wrap content. Now that actually makes it pretty small. So let's actually set its width to be something like that. Yeah, that's probably be good enough. So we'll call that 122. It'll look decent enough. Do we have a width on this guy? Not the best practice to set the uh, width of something to a fixed number of pixels, but we're gonna do it just for time's sake because that does match up to our things, but this might not look the same on every device. Let's call it good enough. So I'll make my three widths for my towers to that 122 number. Um, you know, actually, I think you can do Well, I thought there was a way to do percent. Point three three. There is a way to do percent somehow. I'm just forgetting it right now. All right, so there's my my towers, so they look reasonable there, right? Um, now we're gonna go ahead and we probably want actually all this stuff to be um, down towards the bottom. So all these things live inside of this vertical linear layout. So these guys are all children of that guy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to this vertical linear layout. I'll view all properties, I'll go to his gravity and choose bottom, so does that not suck the stuff down? Let's 
apparently does not. But this guy should be fine. What if we set his gravity to bottom? So we can only do it with the disks in here. We can send those to the bottom, but the layouts don't follow that same. So I guess that's fine. At least visually it'll look like it's down there. All right, so here's our disks. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna make these disks. Um, I'm gonna have the text be centered. So I'm gonna go to gravity for those disks. And we'll center it. So now it's the we have the one, the two, and the three centered. Um, we want to make this have a little bit of a visual. What we can do is we can click on the one. And here's the text. And maybe we do something like uh, an equal sign on either side of the one, maybe with one space. And then with the two, we can. Um, just trying to do something maybe quicker. So we'll do two. And then the other one will have three. So we got some sort of visual representation of it looks okay. Uh, and then we can certainly make the text bigger on those if uh, we want. Make those so show fewer properties and let's do maybe size 24, something like that. Yeah, looks decent enough. All right, so. Um, these are going to be our actual um, text views. So these are the things that we'll be pushing and popping um, off, of our, off of our stack. So when we click on Tower 1, what we want to do is we want to remove this dude. We want to pop it off the stack. And then we want to um, maybe put it into a temporary storage location. All right, so maybe we put another storage location up here above that's kind of like, we pop it off this tower, now it's sitting here. Then we click on the tower we want it to go to and we push it onto that tower. Does that make sense? That way our, our game moves are pop, here's your destination. Source, destination, something like that. We can, we can, then we have to do touch things and stuff like that. So right now we have, we have 58 minutes. So, so we're gonna we're gonna just mechanically do it because we really want to focus on the stack element of this, okay? So, and we're actually gonna implement our own version of MVC. So a stack is a data structure. There's logic associated with a stack, right? But at the same time here, we also have a visual component of our stack. Last class when we wrote our linked lists, we did it all with text, right? We tested it. We had our our linked list class and. And inside of there, we just had a print or a display function that went through and kind of showed us what our, our linked list looked like. Well, now we can actually use a visual representation for it to display our, our stack. Okay. So let's go ahead and we're going to need access to these towers, but we're actually going to, um, well, a tower is a stack, correct? Is that a fair statement? When I say uh, a tower in Towers of Hanoi, that guy is a stack. But he's a stack that maybe works a specific way. So let's go and open up our project here. App, go to Java, go to this guy for Towers of Hanoi. And let's start off by writing a, uh, a simple stack for integers. Okay. Um, the trade-off might be we don't finish this, but I want to make sure you have enough stuff for your homework assignment, worst, worst case scenario. 
So I'm going to make a stack that can hold some integers. For your homework assignment, you're going to have to hold, actually, let's make a stack that can hold strings. That'll cover all your bases, your homework assignment. So that'll be our starting point is we can hold strings. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to create a new Java class. Uh, well, it's, I'll explain it at the very end, but I, it's already up. You have to like read a Wikipedia page. It's more involved than I want to get into right this second, but it's, it's already up and it's using stacks. All right. So we're going to make a stack class. All right. So we're also going to have a node. So a stack is going to be a collection of nodes, just like linked lists are. So we'll have a new Java class node. And similar to what we had before, a node will have a payload. So we'll have a private, but in this case, my payload is going to be a string instead of an int. So it'll be more flexible for us since you're going to need to store different kinds of things in your stack. And we'll call this guy payload. Well, in, in, uh, in our homework that was due today, you, we just stole, stored integers, right? Ints for your homework for uh, um, next class with the shunting yard, you're going to need to store numbers. You're going to need to store operators like plus sign, minus sign, divide. You're going to need to be able to store parentheses. Um, so why not just represent all of those guys as strings? Now we just have one stack for everything and we'll just pull it out and decide what it is and then convert it to what we need it to be because strings are flexible. So private string uh, payload and then we also have private node next node. Pretty similar node to what we had before. Okay. So we'll have our constructor for node and this guy will take in a string payload. We'll say this dot payload is equal to payload. This dot next node is equal to null initially. All right, these guys are both private, so I need to have setters for my next node, and I need to have a getter for my payload. So let's right click, generate. We're gonna go ahead and let's generate a getter for payload. There's my get payload. And then let's generate a setter for next node. So we can set this dude's next node. Okay, and we'll leave it like that for right now. We're gonna be adding to this here in a few minutes. All right, so that's what a node looks like. Now when we go to our stack, we're gonna keep track of the top of the stack. So similar to a linked list where we kept track of the front of the list and it was called head, with a stack we keep track of the top of the stack. Make sense? So public stack, here's a constructor for it. This dot top is equal to null. Okay, so empty stack has nothing in it. Now we have our couple of functions. So we're going to have public void push. And push is kind of like add front for a linked list. In fact, you could implement stacks in terms of linked list just using the correct functions. So push says add to the front. So whatever, we'll just ask if top is equal to null. Currently have the empty list or the empty stack. Then we'll go ahead and say this dot top is equal to, and we're going to need to create our new node here. So we'll say node n is equal to new node. And push here is going to take in a string payload. So we'll build a node with that payload. And then if top is currently nothing, then we'll go ahead and set top equal to, make top point to the node we just created. Otherwise, okay, so when we push something onto our stack, here's the value we wanna push on. We'll wrap it inside of a node, create a brand new node with that value. We'll say, is my stack currently empty? If it is, just make the top of the stack point to this guy. If it's not, I have a new top of the stack. 
because we're always adding to the front. Push always. At the end of push, top will always point to the new guy. But we need to make sure that we fix top, uh, the current version of top, before we let top point to it. So now what we're going to say is we're going to say n dot set next node to this dot top. So make n point to the same place top points to. Then we'll say this dot top is equal to n. We need to preserve the place the top points to first. Then we can go ahead and set make top point to the new node. And that's push. So not a lot to push. What's pop? Public. Um, pop, maybe we say it's going to go ahead and return the string, the payload version of it or something like that. Um, actually, I'm going to have our pop here return a... Um, well, let's have it return the payload. We'll, we'll re-implement this for our, uh, our other guy. So we're going to have this guy go ahead and return the string. It's going to be pop. Now, ultimately, we're going to return top, right? So we're going to say node, node to return is equal to this dot top. Then we'll ask the question, if this dot top is not equal to null, if I have stuff to, re to, to disconnect, then what I'll go ahead and say is I'm going to say this dot top is equal to this dot top dot get next node. Oh, I didn't give me a getter for that guy. I need a getter for next node as well. Generate getter for next node. There we go. So we'll say this dot top is equal to this dot top dot get next node. So if top is currently something, we'll go ahead and set top to whatever the node he points to. Make sense? Then, just so we fully disconnect here, this is the node I'm going to return. I already had previously preserved it before I made any changes to it here. So if top was not equal to null, then I'm going to also say in here, node to return dot set next node to null. That'll disconnect him from the list. So we don't have any flow, uh, pointers floating around out there. All right, so node to return is going to equal to the current top as long as top was not null, as long as we actually have it's pointing to a real place. Go ahead and make top point to his next node and then set node to return's next node to nothing. That way he doesn't point to another place. Finally, return node to return. Except this is a string, so we're going to say node to return dot get payload. The value associated with the node we're returning. All right, and that's pop. And then the last thing would be peak. So we'll say if this dot top is equal to null, um, we can decide how we want to handle it. We can make this a runtime exception, or we can say return empty list or empty stack, something like that. So that would be peak. Notice we're not actually disconnecting it from our stack. We're just showing you whatever the payload is at the top of the stack. It has no impact on the structure of the stack after that. So there's push, pop, and peak. Pretty simple functions. Very similar to 
uh, add front and remove front. Make sense? Okay, so now if we want to reimagine our stack in terms of a tower, what we want to do is this is kind of becomes our, our, our MVC thing. So I'm going to just for the sake of argument here and just to preserve this for you for your homework. I'm going to just copy the guts there. And I'm going to make a new Java class here called Tower. All right, I copied the guts back in there, changed the constructor to be Tower. So now a Tower keeps track of the node that's the top of the stack. Um, but he also needs to keep track of the top um, view of the stack. All right, so we need to expand on our nodes a little bit. So a node in our tower, uh, we call the disk, right? So our tower is a collection of disks. I'm gonna go ahead and say new Java class disk. All right, and similar to node, I'm gonna go ahead and just grab the, the guts. Uh, actually, let's just write it from scratch for this. That's where you're gonna name things a little differently. Well, I mainly made it its own class because I don't, I'm gonna, I want you to have access to this generic stack data structure. That's exactly what you need for your homework assignment or at least the, the kind of the correct starting point, versus a um, uh, the tower that is a stack but is also something more. So I'm kind of implementing two separate stacks. Generic stack and then the tower stack, which is kind of a, let's call it a super stack, because he's going to have the a view aspect to him. So same thing. I'm, I'm reimagining Node as a disk. So this guy's still going to have uh, a payload, but his payload actually, um, well, his payload is going to be a number for, for a disk because we need to know his strength, his size. Is it size one? Is it size two? Is it size three? Because we're going to need to do logic with that. But we also want to have his view, what he looks like. And what he's going to look like is going to be a text view. So we're going to associate the text view associated with this disk um, in here. And I think you'll kind of see where once we get into it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say private. Uh, this guy's going to be an int, int payload. And actually, instead of calling it payload, let's continue to use things that are more tower of Pinoy. So int size, the size of the disk. All right. And then we're also going to have a private text view. the view. So that's going to be what that guy looks like. So now when we build a disk object, so we have public disk, the constructor is going to take in the size and it's also going to take in a text view for the view. That is the text view that represents this particular disk visually. All right. So we'll go ahead and say this dot size is equal to size. This dot the view is equal to the view. All right, so let's just leave it like that for right now. We'll go ahead and put in our setters and getters as we need them. So we'll just kind of let this guy organically kind of grow. All right, so at the very start here, let's, let's connect some of the dots for us. So I'll go back to my activity main. I have three text views in here, right? Disk one TV, disk two TV, disk three TV. This guy is going to live inside of a disk object. All right, so let's see how that's going to work. So we're going to go to our main activity. And let's just make them local variables here first, and then we'll, we'll reconnect them. 
All right. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say um, disk D1 is equal to a new disk. Now a disk takes a size and it takes a um, text view, a view for it. So the first disk is going to be size one, and the text view is going to be this dot find view by ID r dot ID dot disk one TV. But it's specifically going to be the text view version of that guy. So that's my first disk object. My first disk object is something that has a size of one, and this is what he looks like. My second disk object is something that has a size of two. And that's what he looks like. My third disk object is something that has a size of three. And that's what he looks like. Make sense? So now I'm, I'm, these are nodes. I'm, you know, they work just like our nodes from before, except they really have two aspects to it. They have the data we're going to use to say, is this disk bigger or smaller than the disk I'm trying to put it on top of? I need that size. But also, this is what he looks like. Because I'm going to need that what he looks like thing in order to move him around. I'm going to take this disk's um, view, and drop it into this layout. Make sense? All right. So here's some disks. But now I have this tower guy. So a tower, the top of the tower is actually a disk, not a node. Because my stacks, my towers for Towers of Annoy are actually collections of disks instead of collections of nodes. They mean the same thing, just we've written a custom class for what Towers of Annoy requires. All right. So the top of our uh, top of our stack, uh, top of our tower is going to be a disk. When we push something onto here, we're not going to push on a payload. Um, well, we can do a couple different things. We can go ahead and we can push on the disk itself, which is what I think we should do. All right, um, or we can go ahead and push on a, um, uh, maybe give it the size and have it go and hunt down the, the ID for it. I think we should push in, push on the disk itself. So this guy's gonna take in a disk D that we're gonna push onto this tower. So we don't need to create a new node there because we already have the node, we have the disk. If the top is null, so if this, is, if this tower is currently empty, then we'll set the top equal to the disk that we passed in. Otherwise, we're going to set the disk's next node, the disk's next disk. So now we need to go give a, that ability to our disk class. So a disk has a size, it has a view, and then he also needs to know about next disk. So in here, initially, we'll say this dot next disk is equal to null. And then we're going to go ahead and give ourselves a setter. Let's do a getter and setter for next disk. So we need to be able to get the next disk. We need to also be able to set the next disk. So that's what that guy will do. We also need to be able to get the size, and we need to be able to get the view. So generate getters, size and view. <coughs> OK. So now we'll go back into tower. When we're pushing a disk onto a tower, we're going to take that disk. We're going to set the next disk equal to what the current top is. And then update top 
to now point to the disk we just added. So that's what push does. What does pop do? Well, that's what push does right now. So think about it a little bit farther here in a second. What does pop do? Pop is going to go ahead and we're going to be returning the disk at the top. So this is the disk to return. Then we'll say if top is not equal to null, then go ahead and set top equal to this.top.getNextDisk. And then disk to return dot set next disk to null. And that will disconnect him from that particular tower. And then ultimately return. And we're going to have this guy, instead of returning a string, we're going to have it return the entire disk. When we pop something off a tower, that's the whole disk, right? It's going to be handy for us because now we can move around our view and our size all in one big chunk. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and return a disk and the disk we're going to return is disk to return. All right, then peak. We'll have this guy return a disk. And we'll just have it return this dot top. So if there's nothing in there, it'll give us a null value. Otherwise, it'll give us whatever disk's at the top. But it allows us to peek in there to see what it is. Okay. Okay, so that's what a tower is for right now. Now, when we go back here to our design, just as we've mentioned that our disk, so this is a disk, this is a disk, this is a disk. So this guy's going to have a size of one, and this is what he looks like. This guy's going to have a size of two, and this is what he looks like. And this guy's going to have a size of three, and this is what he looks like. Just as we have that, doesn't a tower actually need to also keep track of this view group associated with the... Uh, um, I guess his, this is a vertical linear layout in which his text views live. That makes sense? So just because I'm maintaining the stack data structure behind the scenes that has this guy linked to this guy linked to this guy, I also need to maintain the visual aspect of this tower and make sure that these three guys have been pushed onto or added to this uh, tower in the right order. Okay, so that's why we have tower one layout, tower two layout, tower three layout. Those are the three, we have those three vertical uh, linear layouts that we have access to. I'm going to go into our tower, and our tower will know what disk is at the top, but he also needs to know about the, this guy's going to be a view group. Uh, the vertical layout. That makes a decent sense. So this is actually the, 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 the tower's view, if you want to think about it like that. Um, actually, if you want to stay consistent, why don't we call this the view associated with our tower. That guy just happens to be a view group because he happens to be a linear layout instead of a text view. Right, so what we see when it comes to a tower is we see a collection of text views. And what's actually holding those text views? A view group. So now, when we take in, when we have the constructor for our tower, this guy is going to take in a view group as a parameter. Set this dot, the view equal to the view. Make sense? And now what we can do is back here in main activity, here's my three disks. Forget about the disks for a second. Now I'm going to say tower T1 is equal to new tower. Now a tower takes a view group as a parameter. So I'm going to pass it the view group version of this dot 
find view by ID r dot ID dot um, tower one layout. That'll build my tower one. Tower two. Tower three. All right, so there's my three towers. Now, so I have three towers that are all represented by these three layouts. When I push something onto the tower, so right now I happen to know that these disks live in, um, uh, those disks do live inside of the very first tower, right? So I, They are currently in that tower. They're already in that view group for that tower, but they actually aren't in that tower's uh, initial stack. So the tower is not mean, it, we're not synchronized there, and I'll kind of show you what I mean. So when we come into tower, when we push something, we push a disk onto our tower, whether we have put it on top of, or whether he became the top of the tower here, with just setting top equal to it, or we put them on top of the guy that used to be there. In either case, we need to visually put this disk at the top of this view group. Okay? And we do that by adding him at position at an index at position zero. So the very first thing I'm going to do here though. Uh, and this is going to be helpful for us, even though uh, um, we've already put these three things in here as a kind of what's called a temporary storage location. They happen to be in the position we want them to be in, right? They already are where we want them to be, but we really need them to get into there in the right way. So the very first thing I'm going to do with every single tower is we're just going to make sure that the tower, when it's first born, is empty. He empties himself out. Now we're going to be okay here because we've already preserved our disks. We already have pointers to our, our guys here. No problem. We haven't lost them. Inside the constructor for our tower though, as soon as we set the view, I'm going to say this dot the view dot remove all views. That'll clear all those text views out of there. So all of our linear layouts will be empty when a tower is first born. But it's okay, because we already preserved all those text views inside of our disks. We haven't lost them. They just are no longer in tower one. We're about to put them right back. But we're going to put them right back in the right way. So now when we go back to tower, when we push a disk onto a tower, this is the data structure portion of it, right? This is the logic associated with how stacks are stored. This is the view aspect of it. What do, how do we visualize this new stack, this new tower? Make sense? So this is what we're going to see. So after we've already set it to be the new thing, we're going to say this dot the view dot add view add index. The index we're going to put it at is, um, well, the guy we're going to add is the disk we just added's view. So that is d dot get the view. And we're going to add it at position zero. Then it'll add it to the top of that guy. So rather than naturally letting it fall at the bottom, we did this last class. Right? When we were adding stuff to our linear layout inside of our scroll view, we always added it at zero, so that was going to be the top guy. So this will, I believe zero will be the top. I don't think it's the bottom. I have to test this. All right, so this should be uh, at the top. So as we push a disk, we'll deal with the logic of the stack, but then visually position those disks. So I should push three, disk three, then disk two, then disk one. 
That's the order in which I want to push it. Make sense? Yeah, so we've visually built them as being this tower has some stuff in it. This tower does not. This tower does that. Well, these actually aren't towers. These are the visual representation of our towers. These guys get married to our tower right here. This is when we actually associate that linear layout with our tower. But the very first thing we do for each tower as they're being born is we go ahead and remove all of his views. That way when we put them back in, we're putting them back in the correct way. So we just use this as a placeholder here. We could have actually put them, they didn't need to be inside this linear layout. We could have put it up here somewhere just as a out and about, just we just created them to be somewhere. Um, but we need to make sure they get back into the stack because we need to maintain two things, what it looks like and what it is. Here's our logic. So we'll empty this guy out and then put the disks into tower one, into T1. So the way stacks will work, we would push disk three on, then disk two on top of that, then disk one on top of that. T1 dot push D3, T1 dot push D2, T1 dot push D1. And that will add it to the stack representation of the tower as well as put it back into the linear layout, the view aspect of it, so we see it again. So on create, we'll go ahead and grab the three disks. So here's the text views associated with those disks. And then here is the size for each of those disks. Then we'll go ahead and grab our three linear layouts for our towers and build our towers. And as part of that building process, the towers will remove those text views from them the first time through. Then we'll put those text views right back by adding the three disks to the tower, which then add the text views back into the linear layout of that tower. So when we push a disk onto a tower, this logic up here sets all the pointers up for the underlying storage of the tower, the stack. Then we actually put the text view associated with that disk back into the linear layout for that tower. So it looks right again. Okay. So our hope here is that, well, our initial test at least, is that when we launch this, we should see our thing look just like this. Depending on adding zero, uh, adding it at bucket zero, it's possible we're gonna be putting them upside down. I don't remember whether zero was the right one or it was the last thing, but we'll see. So if they're upside down, then we'll have to use the length. If they're not upside down, then we're good. <clears throat> we're good okay so now we want to program these buttons so when I hit this button I want this tower to pop the top disc off there assuming there is a disc and maybe put it into a little holding zone up here, like a landing place, but I should see it leave here and I should see it appear here. Make sense? In preparation for me to put it back someplace else. So let's go back into our tower and we have to consider how pop works. Yeah, so there's a um, is it this dot this dot the view dot add view um, d dot get well here I'll just dot get child count. This tells me the total number of children that are in there, so I would add it to that 
minus one. Okay, so we need to update pop now because pop will return the disk we're popping. But I also need to visually remove it from that linear layout. Okay, so if there actually was something to remove here, then I'm going to go ahead and say this dot the view dot remove view at index zero. That'll take the view out of there so it won't have the top text view anymore. But we're still going to return the disk that still has that text view. Make sense? Now we need to give ourselves a landing zone. So I'm going to give myself just a little kind of buffer up here, a place to drop something. So let's just give myself a horizontal linear layout up top. All right, and we're going to call this guy, um, uh, call it landing landing zone okay and we're actually going to have his height wrap content so it's basically going to be nothing there at first but when we put something there it'll stretch out a little bit to house the text view okay so our main activity is going to have to keep track of that well we're probably going to have a towers of annoy game that these guys will all live in, but for right now, we can just put it in here. So let's go ahead and let's write our functions for those three buttons. Okay. So we're going to have a public tower one button pressed UV. And this guy's going to return void. And then, oh, well, we'll actually fill it in. Now, in order for this to work, I'm going to need to have access to these towers. Right? So I need my towers to actually be global variables here. So we're going to say private tower1. T1, private tower T2, private tower T3. Now I actually don't need the disks to be global because I only need the disks initially when we put them into the towers. Then I'll grab them as they're coming out, right? I don't need to have global access to the three disks. So now this is no longer tower T1, it's just T1, T2. T3. So now these functions down here will have access to those towers. So when tower button one is pressed, we're going to, uh, we need to check our landing zone, to see if there's anything in there, right? So we're going to have a private disk. Um, actually, let's just call this guy temp for right now. And temp will start off as null. There is no disk inside of temp. We are going to need, though, a private view group. We'll call this guy landing zone. And then in here, we'll say this dot landing zone is equal to the view group version of this dot find view by ID r dot ID dot landing zone. So that'll give us access to that landing zone that we can then add something to. Okay, so when we press a button, the current value of temp will tell us whether or not we're popping or we're pushing. Because if temp is currently null, that means we are popping into temp. If temp currently has a value, that means we must be pushing the value of temp into something else. 
But let's just go one direction first just to see it work. So we're just going to write the, the first button. So we'll say if temp is equal to null, we're going to say pop top of tower one into temp. So we'll say this dot t1 dot pop and pop returns a disk. And what are we going to do with that disk? We're going to put it in this dot temp. Okay. But now we only actually want to do that if there was a top of that tower. You can't pop off an empty tower, right? So if temp is equal to null and t1 dot peak is not equal to null, as long as there's something in that tower, am I supposed to pop? And is the place I'm trying to pop from, does it have something to pop? If yes, go ahead and pop it. And then we also need to, because we're popping it, well, actually popping it, it will have removed it. But we now need to throw the text view associated with that guy into our landing zone. So we'll say this dot landing zone dot add view. We can actually just do add view because there's only going to ever be one view in there. And the view we'll add is called this dot temp dot get the view. The view representation of that disk. We'll add it into our landing zone. Okay. So that's for tower button one pressed. So let's go and hook that guy up. So here's tower button one. Here's on click. It doesn't look like it's uh, showing up yet. How about now? There we go. So now when I hit this button, he's going to check himself and say, first of all, is temp null? Initially, temp is null. Then it's going to say, when I peek at the top of this tower, is there something there? Yeah, there is. So we're going to go ahead and pop this guy. It should disappear from here, and it should show up up here. Make sense? And I think it's going to actually be left justified initially. I want it to be centered. So I'm going to take this landing zone and I'm going to set his gravity to center. Like that. So anything we throw in here will be in the middle of that guy. Okay. So let's go test this. So we pop it, now it goes up there, and it left here. So now the idea would be that if I hit this again, it should push it back onto there. We won't check any of the rules yet for Towers of Noe. We'll you're allowed to push it. <laughs> we won't check against the size. So let's go throw the else on there. Uh, where was I? Here. So, you know, to write this better, we really should. I'm going to take the and out of here. That way I can. So I'm going to say if temp is equal to null, then if that's true, then do stuff. And the reason I'm going to do that, even though functionally what we just wrote is identical to what there was there before, now I can just say else here. Because if I'm in this else, that means temp was not equal to null, which means I should do push. All right, so push temp onto T1. So I'll say this dot T1 dot push this dot temp. And I'll say this dot temp is equal to no empty it back out. Okay. 
Okay, so now I should be able to pop off of there. Ruh -roh. Push. What happened? What did you do? Let's go into our tower. Let's go look at push. Push says if the top is equal to null, which it's not, else we'll set the next disk equal to this dot top. And this dot top. This appears to be where it died. Specified child already has a parent. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Makes perfect sense, actually. Let's go back to our main activity here. I can't push temp onto this tower because temp currently lives inside of my placeholder. So before I do this, I need to say this dot, um, uh, what landing zone, dot remove all views. Now he's emptied out so that our child text view no longer has a parent. He's not living any place so I can now free and clear push him onto this tower. A text view can't be in two places at once. It can't be in the landing zone and in the linear layout for my tower at the same time. I had to remove them from the landing zone first so I could put them into this. No, because I, I still have the disk associated with that guy stored in temp. Yeah, so I'm just removing the pointer to that view from that guy. All right, so now this guy should work. So pop it, push it back. So over and over again. That's what I could, that's what my thing could be right now. <laughs> All right, but you can see it wouldn't be that big of a deal to go ahead and program the same things for the other buttons. So I can then have this guy push down to this one and have it move around. Wouldn't be that big of a deal, right? I'm not following the Towers of Hanoi rules yet because I will allow something. Well, I mean, at this point, I, can, I have no way of breaking the rule right now, but I'm not checking whether or not I'm allowed to push it before I push it. So we'll do that. Um, uh, maybe we'll finish this up maybe at the beginning of class next time and then come and look at the other thing. But let me take a few minutes and go through uh, the homework assignment just so we make sure everybody understands it. So I'll go ahead and I'll uh, import this into version control. Okay, so that guy's up there. And here, I'll paste a link to it on our Slack channel. I assume all of you are on the Slack channel. Okay. Now, let's look at shunting yard algorithm. I'm going to give you a link to this. I'll give you a link to the Wikipedia page for this. Okay. So, shunting yard is, um, how many of you have heard of something called reverse Polish notation? 
All right, so um, the uh, Hewlett-Packard calculators typically use what's called reverse polish, where effectively you put things into uh, the calculator as a stack. So you'll say three enter, two enter, plus enter, and it'll apply that plus operator to the three and the two, giving you a five, pushing the five back onto the stack. So we're taking that to the next level. The idea of the shunting yard algorithm, it's, um, if you think back to last semester when you, uh, in 535, when you had that, um, uh, that process expression guy where you had something that maybe looks like, uh, well, let's do something. Uh, they have a more complicated one up here somewhere. Yeah, here, something like this. So three plus four times two minus one, and since this is in parentheses, that should happen first, right? This would be very difficult to solve without having, <clears throat> without having stacks, okay? Because realistically, what should the answer of this be? This should be two minus one, which is one. Multiplication takes preference over addition, so this is four times one, which is four, plus three is seven. Make sense? Um, so that's what that guy should do. Although this is kind of a crappy example because even if you do left or right, it's the, it's the, it's the same. Um, here, they probably give you a, a better one down here. They do something with numbers. Well, regardless. Um, Punchline here is, is that orders of operation is important, right? There isn't an easy way to do orders of operation. That's why the shunting yard algorithm exists. So the idea here is that you tokenize your, um, your, your string. So let's kind of walk through this. So I'm gonna give you an example. We'll call this shunting yard. All right, so let's do uh, one plus two times three. Something relatively, uh, um, Simple, I guess. So that should be six plus one is seven, maybe minus four should give me my three, as opposed to three times nine. So that's uh, three times three is nine, nine times four or minus four is five. So if we go left to right, this should give me a five. If I do correct orders of operation, that's two times three is six, six plus one is seven, seven minus four is three. The correct answer, this should be three, all right? So let's look at how shunting yard handles this. So the first thing that shunting yard says to do, so it says take all your inputs and you need to load them, you kind of need to tokenize them, put them into a linked list, all right? So we're gonna go through this and we're gonna turn this into a one linked to a plus, linked to a two, linked to a uh, multiply, linked to a three, Link to that, link to that. Now, you can actually do this, use our string stack to do this. It's okay if this guy's in a stack because it's not gonna hurt anything. So you wanna load all of those individual tokens into a stack, so that's gonna be the first problem you need to solve, is how do you process um, a string? Because keep in mind, this might have been like 111 or you know, 104 or something like that. So you would have needed to make sure this is a number, this is a number, this is a number, grab that piece, and then go and uh, um, add it to my stack. Then get operator, then get number, then get operator. You also have to look for parentheses, um, stuff like that. So part of the problem here is tokenizing your input string into something that, uh, um, you know, into its individual chunks so that you can add them to your string stack, all right? Once you have it in a format that looks like this, I'll just go ahead and put back the one, then we'll go ahead and apply the algorithm. So that means that we have it sitting in a format like this where we can grab the individual pieces. That's all that's required initially is that you can get your individual pieces of your formula, okay? It's still in the original order here. So what we do is we have an operator stack, and we have an output stack. So we're gonna call this op stack. 
Um, well, I gave you this uh, starting homework assignment. I gave you the, the Towers of Hanoi, so you have the stack from that. All right, so we have our off stack. So now as we process this, so we're going to feed off of this, um, this list over here, or this queue. So this is our input. We're going to look at something. If what we're looking at is an operator, then we're going to consider whether it should go in the operator stack. But if we're looking at a number, it goes right to the output stack. So A is like a number in their example here. So I grab the A, it goes immediately into the output queue. So actually, we would call this output, call it output list. So this is a always add to end. So I'll grab that one. So we're going to add the one to our um, output list. And then we'll burn that off of our input. The next thing I get is the plus sign. So that guy, so you're not allowed, so this is kind of a Towers of Hanoi type of thing. Operators have powers associated with them. Uh, let's see, where's the... So plus and minus have the same power. Um, multiply and divide have a larger value. And to a power has a even larger value. So what we do here is we ask ourselves, okay, this guy's an operator. So we've, we've detected he's an operator. Can he go on to the operator stack? That is to say, is what's already in the operator stack a higher priority than him? Right now it's empty, so it's not. I'm allowed to push this guy onto that stack. Okay. So we'll come into our stack. We'll push the plus sign onto that stack, onto the op stack. So now we have the plus sign down there. Then we go to the B. Well, the B is not an operator, so it goes right to the end of the output. So I needed to burn this off. So now my two goes to the end of the output. So I'll, I'll draw little arrows here. It goes to the end of the output. Burn off the two. Okay, then I'm going to go to the multiplication. Multiplication has a higher precedent than addition. So I am allowed to put it on top of that. So it's almost like the inverse of Towers of Hanoi. I can put larger uh, values on top of smaller ones. But if it's less than or equal to, I have to pop stuff. You'll see that here in a second. So I can go ahead and put the multiplication then on top of this guy. So there's the multiplication, which now links to that. So I pushed it onto the op stack. We burn past this guy. Then it's a three. Three goes immediately to the end of our output list. Now we're at a minus. So a minus is an operator. We look at the top of the op stack, which is multiplication. Minus is not allowed to go on there. Okay. Minus can't go on there, and we'll just we'll finish up here in a second. So minus can't go on there, so we're kind of looking at it like this. So in order to put a minus on here, we need to take off everything, keep popping from it until we finally hit something that is smaller than the value. We are not allowed to put things that are equal to or less than. Oh, we're only allowed to put things that are less than the thing that's currently at the top of the stack. So that means I need to pop the multiplication and add it to my output. So my output now is going to have the multiplication, pop it off of here. Then my output is going to have the addition, pop it off of here. Now I'm allowed to put the minus in there. So I'll go ahead and take the minus. Then I hit the four. So that's my last output. Now I'm done, so I need to go and clear out my op stack until it's empty. So my final thing is I have my minus there for my op stack. So now my output list is in the format that it needs to be in to process. 
So when you come back in here, you're left with something that looks like this. So now when you walk back through this, this gives you the orders of operation for this guy. So your, um, this is our final uh, output stack thing here. So now you start processing these guys as if it was a stack. So we're gonna say one is on the stack, now two, now three, then we hit multiplication. What does multiplication, multiplication do? It consumes the previous two values. So three times two is six, pushes the value back onto the stack. So there's my six. Then I get the plus, that's an operator. What do operators do? It consumes the next two values on the stack. So six plus one is seven, pushes it back onto the stack. Then I get the four, push that onto the stack. And then I get the minus, minus says consume the next one. So it's seven minus four, which gives me my three, push that back on the stack, that's my final answer. Make sense? All right, so I promise you, this isn't as hard as it looks. Most of it's gonna be sitting there, making sure you understand how shunting yard works. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll give you a little reprieve in the homework. So for your homework, you do not need to make powers work and you do not need to make parentheses work. Okay, so just order of operation for plus minus times divide. Sound fair? All right. So we're doing stack manipulation stuff. Now it shouldn't be the end of the world, but definitely, 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 definitely Walk through examples with shunting yard first. Make sure you understand that because I guarantee that if you don't know how shunting yard works, you're not going to be able to write code to implement it. All right. All right. I will see everybody. And then there's a writing assignment up as well for binary trees, which is what we're looking at next week. All right. I'll see everybody on, well, I'll see some of you on uh, uh, Saturday. Otherwise, I'll see the rest of you next Tuesday.